It's always, always uh, nice to have uh, visitors on a Sunday morning. And as is our practice, we make any visitors stand up and give uh, at least a 10-minute life story in front of everyone. <laughs> Just kidding over there, Jacob. <laughs> and uh, also, I, I want to welcome, uh, because I know that you would want to know this, but um, Pastor Butch and, and Jennifer uh, Hallenbach, they serve in Glenwood, Washington, over on the west side. Uh, with Village Missions, and they're over here visiting some friends, and um, Butch has gone out and done some fishing, and uh, I saw a picture of a pretty nice size um, sturgeon last night on uh, Facebook, and so we're glad to have Pastor and Mrs. Hound back with us, uh, who serve with Village Missions, and so welcome, we're glad to have you guys. Um, it wasn't quite as large as the fish that swallowed Jonah, but um, it was a nice fish. Um, today we're going to be finishing up our series in Jonah. If you have your Bible with you or your app, please open it to chapter 4 of the prophet Jonah. We are going to be finishing up this little series that we've had this summer. And I want you to know also at the outset that I don't take this morning lightly as I've prayed and prepared and thought about this final chapter of Jonah and why it's here. In many ways, from a human point of view, I think that the, the book of Jonah should have ended at chapter 3. This, he, he finally obeys God and he goes into that great city, Nineveh, a city that was 60 miles across and housed some 600,000 people. 120,000 small children that are mentioned at the end of this chapter. And you know how resistant he was to doing that and how he fleed. We saw in chapter 1 that he was the prodigal prophet who went in the opposite direction for southwestern Spain uh, to flee to Tarshish, some 2,200 miles or so away from where God called him to go. And we saw uh, in chapter 2 his intercession and prayer and cry from the belly of the great fish that God had appointed. Then in chapter 3 he is recommissioned, and we saw this for two weeks in a row, where he went into Nineveh to preach the message that God had given him to preach. And... Um, as far as I know, I don't know of a, another awakening, another revival as great as what happened in Nineveh. It says that from the smallest all the way to the king, that they were broken in repentance and the fear of the Lord, and they believed in God. And so it's just been a, an incredible book to dig into as we've looked at various details and used a bit of imagination um, believing it to be historic record of what actually took place. And so I say, the book should have ended, from my point of view, at chapter 3. And God relented of the calamity that he was going to bring on Nineveh. And they had about a hundred years uh, reprieve before Nahum came along, prophesying their destruction. And so God gave them time. But it doesn't end there. Chapter 4 is a strange chapter. I think you can see up on the screen today we complete our journey through Jonah. We have seen Jonah as the prodigal, the praying, and the preaching prophet. From a human point of view, chapter 3 should end the book. But this final chapter seems quite strange. Or does it? Could it be that we are more like Jonah than we realized? And so today I want to talk to you about your soul. Yeah? Not the person behind you or to your left. I want to talk to you about your soul. Because as those who have been united to Christ and come to faith in him, and been reconciled to God, God has called every one of us to live free on the earth, 
free of resentment, free of bitterness, free of that caustic spirit that is uh, so uh, toxic and so poisonous in our own souls and in our own relationships. And this is a strange, a very strange, and not only, not only does the fourth chapter seem strange, but even the way it ends is strange because God in, seems to have left off verse 12. It ends abruptly at verse 11, and then it's as though Jonah had to write verse 12. It's as though you have to write verse 12 and I have to write it. So as we look at this, uh, just quickly a connection between chapter 3 and chapter 4. Uh, in chapter 3, God is ministering through the life of Jonah, through his proclamation as he went into that city preaching. So God ministered through Jonah to that great city. In chapter 4, it completely changes, and God now is ministering to Jonah himself as he seeks to refine him and correct him for issues of the heart. My brothers and sisters, <laughs> most of us uh, agree that drinking and gambling and cussing and so on are sins and uh, we should avoid them and I fully agree. Uh, my wife had me laughing the other night. She said, you know, all the kids at school know I'm a Christian. They all know I'm a believer. And I have these rabble-rousing boys that come around and, and they tease me. But it's in kind of fun because she helps them pass their courses and helps them graduate. But she had two or three little boys, uh, high school boys, juniors, seniors, come up to her one day toward the end of the year. And they said, Mrs. Pinkham, you told us months ago that you have never cussed. <laughs> and she said, well, that's, that's true. Uh, I'm sure the attitude that's behind someone that, that cusses has been in me, but I haven't swore in my whole life. And um, they said, we just can't believe that. And she said, well, it's true. I love the Lord and he loves me. And uh, he's put a muzzle over my mouth since I was a little girl. And then they said to her, well, we've, got, we've put our money together, and we'll give you $20 if you'll just cuss one time. <laughs> and she said, no, it's not worth $20. Nothing's worth it. And they said, well, what if, what if we had a million dollars that we could give you? And she said, are you trying to compare a million dollars with the God who loves me, the God I call Father? Is that what you guys are up to? And so they had this banter back and forth and had some fun with it. But um, we all agree that stuff like that is... But you know what? The most difficult sins in your life and in mine to overcome are not those external sins. They're sins of the heart, sins of disposition, sins of attitude. And this is what happens in chapter 4. It seems amazing to me that this vast city of Nineveh has now been broken in its sin and converted and turned to God. And God then turns his attention on little bitty Jonah, his prophet, and says, we're not quite done yet. We have some matters of your heart to deal with. So that's where we're going today, God's caring correction. And it is tender, it is loving, it isn't harsh. God gets it, he understands what's going on with Jonah. He understands that Assyria is the arch enemy of Israel. He's known from boyhood that this great empire one day is going to march down through Israel and bring great suffering, and, and he's heard all about them, and we've talked about that. Well, he hates these people. He wants nothing to do with them. He loves his own country and his own people. So he's quite provincial in his picking and choosing who he will love and care about. So in this great chapter, three simple points, God's caring correction, 
First of all, he deals with a lousy attitude. Can we use the word lousy in church? You ever had a lousy attitude? Let's start in verse 1, just the opening four verses. So upon God turning away his judgment on Nineveh and, a, and withdrawing his hand to destroy them, now Jonah shows his, his heart again, verse 1. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. And the idea there is hot. He was hotly angry. Verse 2, he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? I knew what you were going to do, in other words. Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, here's a great solution, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. This is, a, this is a pity party par excellent, is it not? And the Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? You know, no one is a counselor to our souls like God. He knows just the right questions to ask us, doesn't he? And I'm just naive enough to believe that someone here this morning, maybe more than one, needs that precise question. Do you have good reason to be angry, especially in light of all my mercies to you, all my grace to you, the pardon of all your sin? the restoration of your life to me, the promise of, of heaven forever, all by my grace and through the death of my son on the cross and his resurrection, all of this I lavish upon you. And now I ask you, do you have good reason to be angry? That's a question for our souls, is it not? And so Jonah is being corrected by God for this lousy attitude. And it's interesting, Jonah is a good theologian, isn't he? Look at what he knows about the character of God. He says, God, I know you're gracious. I know you're compassionate. I know you're slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. That's the kind of God you are. And that you relent concerning calamity if repentance is wrought. So what was wrong with Jonah? Well, the problem is, isn't that Jonah doesn't understand God's nature and character. Jonah doesn't want to be in harmony with it. Jonah doesn't want to be the channel of that spirit, of that grace, of that mercy, of that loving kindness towards those that he despised. Well, yeah, I'm going to do this. A.W. Tozer wrote a little treatise called The Evils of a Bad Disposition. And this is what he wrote. A bad disposition has been called the vice of the virtuous. The woman who would not gamble or drink or attend places of worldly amusements may yet manifest a churlish temper and keep her family in terror with her acid tongue. 
and a man who will fight for the faith once, once for all delivered to the saints may be so hard to live with that his own family actually wishes him gone and feels little real sorrow when he finally shuffles off this mortal scene as he fondly assumes that he's on his way to peace in heaven forever. And then he says, dispositional sins are fully as injurious. In other words, attitude sins can do just as much damage to the Christian cause as the more overt acts of wickedness. These sins are as many and as various as human nature. Just so, just so there may be no misunderstanding, he says, let me just list a few. Oversensitiveness, defensiveness, irritability, churlishness, fault finding, peevishness, temper tantrums, resentfulness, cruelty, and uncharitable attitudes. And of course, there are many, many more. These kill the spirit of a church and slow down its progress, which the gospel may be making in the community. End of quote. Attitudes that need adjusted. So first God is dealing with Jonah. After all that he's been through, now it's just God and the soul of Jonah. And first he deals with his lousy attitude. Well, how does Jonah respond to it? Now remember, Jonah was to go into the city and preach. And the city was given 40 days, right? You remember that? 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So we really don't know from the book of Jonah how long he was in the city. We know it was a three-day walk just to get across the city. It was a big place with many people. So was he there four or five days? Was he there a couple weeks? Was he there longer? We don't know. But when God says this to Jonah and asks him this question in verse um, 4, the Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Jonah doesn't answer him. It says in verse 5, then Jonah went out from the city. And what we're looking at now is God's correction for his lack of consistency. We have such a need in our lives to seek the Lord and his grace every day to maintain consistency so that we don't find ourselves living by mere emotion and the tides of circumstances and find ourselves pitched and tossed by what's going on around us. We need reinforced on the inside so that there can be something of a consistency about our walk with God and the disposition that we display with those around us. And so God corrects him here. Look at verse 5. Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. <laughs> I just, this is so fascinating, Jonah is. And so it's like he, he, he goes out and finds a good seat on the 50-yard line and just watches to see what's going to happen. And the sad part, of course, is that he's hoping for judgment. He's hoping God will overthrow the city. But God is a compassionate God, a God of mercy, a God slow to anger, and he's going to show this great city mercy, and Jonah is hoping contrary to that. And so in verse 6 it says, um, So the Lord appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah, to be a shade over his head, to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah, watch this, was extremely happy about the plant. 
He's gone from hotly angry over Nineveh and the possibility that it's going to repent and be delivered to being extremely happy because there's a plant that God caused to grow to grant him shade from the hot sun. Actually, in these verses, God appoints three things. He appoints a plant. And these are all object lessons to get to Jonah's heart. A plant to shade him. Then he appoints a worm, which could be a collective noun, could be worms. But they are, this plant is infested, and it dies. And so he appoints a plant, a worm, and then one of those oriental hot winds that blow across the desert in that area that are just, you head for shade if you can find it. Very, very hot and dry, blistering wind. And, to, and so to point out Jonah's lack of consistency, God appoints these three things and he has, a, he has teaching woven into this whole circumstance. And so there in verse 7, but God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. You know, there are, there's prayers offered in every chapter of Jonah. Every single chapter. In chapter 1, the sailors offer their prayer with fasting as they cry out to Jonah's God to rescue them. And God does. In chapter 2, we have Jonah praying with faith in God and quoting from a number of psalms from the belly of that great fish. In chapter 3, we have the Ninevites uh, who are uh, broken over their sin and repentant in sackcloth and ashes and fasting. And so there's prayer in all three chapters and they're all answered. The only prayer in this, chapter, in this book that's not answered is Jonah's request that God take his life. Aren't you glad God doesn't always answer your prayers? And there are times where life is, feels so bitterly difficult for us that it's possible that even in a small group like us, someone has felt just like that at some point in their life. Maybe you didn't contemplate taking it, but you just wish the Lord would take you because you hurt so much and were so upset. Well, Jonah's being corrected for his lousy attitude, for being angry, for his lack of consistency. What do we mean by that? Well, Jonah's really happy about this plant, and then he's downcast when the plant dies, and God's going to deal with him regarding that as, as the next one opens up. Jonah, your problem is you've lost all perspective. And that's the third. God corrects him for his loss of perspective. Look at how this book, the climax of this book. Uh, again, it, it just puzzles me that chapter 3 and Nineveh's conversion is not the climax of the book. Here it is, beginning at verse 9. Look at it. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. <laughs> then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have had compassion on Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand. That speaks of small children. A mixed, about 600,000 people that were in the city, 120,000 of them uh, were just small children. 
And God is saying to Jonah, look at your heart condition. You're more troubled about a plant whose life span was 24 hours. You didn't plant it. it did, you didn't grow it. I did. And you're upset about that. And yet, you don't care anything about the lost that I am going to spare in the city of Nineveh. This is not a small matter, is it? But you know the interesting thing is this. This may seem, let me put it this way. When you carry around anger, and frozen anger is often the cause of depression, and you carry that around and you harbor bitterness and resentment toward others, your love for the lost dwindles to but a flicker at best. We're never going to have the freedom to love the lost, to love everyone, to love all kinds and care enough about them to share the gospel with them. We're not going to do that if we have a lousy attitude, if we lack consistency, and if we have lost perspective on what matters most. I wrote down this little note here, you know. God takes off his mask and reveals his heart to Jonah. That's what's happening here. It's as though Jonah didn't get it, that God loved the Ninevites. He cared about them and their children and their livestock and their livelihoods. He didn't really want to destroy them. But their wickedness had so come up before him that he had to uh, send Jonah with a message of judgment. God takes off his mask and reveals his heart, and in doing so, he reveals Jonah's heart as well. Think about this. Everything that you and I are involved in on planet Earth is in the process of perishing. Except the investment we make in the spiritual lives of people. Everything else is in the process of decay and perishing. And God has called us all called us all to be his representatives in our spheres of influence and in our workplace, on the job, amongst extended family. We're called by him. But if we're carrying lousy attitudes, this lack of consistency, and this loss of an eternal perspective, then we're going to live one foot in front of the next just like a person who doesn't even know the Lord. Are you following me? Now, I realize this isn't necessarily a feel-good message, but we're preachers of the word, right? We want to know what the scriptures teach. And God is bringing Jonah up short. And why would he do that? And why? And here's the crux. This one really, I was sitting yesterday afternoon thinking about this. Do we realize who wrote this book? Humanly speaking, we know God inspired it. Who wrote the book of Jonah? Jonah. The prophet Jonah wrote this. If you were to write the end of your story and it was this, would you include it? There's humility here in Jonah. I believe that verse 12 for Jonah, uh, and this is what I want to think, is that, and Jonah realized how out of sync his heart was with the heart of God. And Jonah repented. He repented of his lousy attitude and his uh, lack of consistency and regained his perspective. And um, this is just Tonyology. And my hope is that he went right back into the city 
to do the follow-up that was necessary to minister to those people. Now, that's just me. But Jonah wrote this. Is that how you'd write your autobiography? Would you, wouldn't you have left this chapter out? But not if you came to repentance and had humility before God and God did a work in your heart. So the 12th verse isn't there. And it's not there not only because it was left up to Jonah, his response to God, but it was not, it's not there because it's left up to you. What will you do, what will I do with lousy attitudes? Deal with them, right? Years ago, in a church long, far, far away, not this one, there was a very dear man in our church. He was an elder. And um, I just love this man. I know that both the couple have gone home now, but his wife, I know that she hurt a lot. She, she had arthritis pretty badly and walked a bit bent over and I know life was a strain for her and but he was the sweetest natured man you'd ever want to meet he'd do anything for you and he'd do it with a smile he was just a great man and I just loved him dearly but he lived with his wife and she was um, she was rough and she was rough on him, and rough on me sometimes, and uh, rough on church people, and I think people just over time began to just make allowances for it. I never liked it. I never thought she should be able to run her mouth like she did. But then I got a phone call. Pastor Tony, please, please, can you come quickly? Because where we lived was about 20 miles away from the closest EMT. And her husband had gone out, worked all morning in the garden and come in, had a little bite to eat and went in and laid down on the bed to rest. And um, he crossed his feet at the ankles and put his hands on his chest and laid back on his pillow and died. And she called in a frantic for me to And when I got there, he clearly <coughs> Uh, was dead, but she was sobbing and pleading with me to do CPR, so I tried to do CPR for 15 minutes or so until the EMTs finally got there, half an hour maybe, just trying to, mostly for her sake, because she was so frantic. But when this was all over and we had the funeral, I never put so much into a funeral as a young pastor. We had a funeral memorial service there. Then we traveled from there down to Southern California where we went to Forest Lawn. They were wealthy people. Forest Lawn and had a big funeral down there. And uh, I mean, it was a long drive from where I was clear to Southern California and back and uh, this whole situation. Then when we got back, she decided that uh, there ought to be a large portrait of her husband hanging in the church. And when I finally said, you know, we're, we're just, you need to think of something else that we can do for him. I understand why you feel this way, but uh, we're not going to put a life-size portrait of your husband in the sanctuary. Well, then she was mad at me. And on that particular Sunday, when I told her we weren't going to do it, she got up and stomped out of church and headed out to her car. But you know what? This is the only time in 40 years of ministry I've ever done this. And I just felt compelled by the Lord. And I just followed her right out. And I came right up to the window of her car, and I leaned in, and I said, you need to turn the engine off and you need to get yourself right back in church and you need to 
deal with this lousy attitude. Because you and I both know that all of this that you're doing is compensating for the sadness you feel for all the harsh things that you've said through the years. And he loved you anyway. And that was, I couldn't believe I did that. <laughs> but somebody had to, and nobody, everybody walked on eggshells around her. Somebody had to say it. And I told her, you've got to deal with this attitude or you're going to be imprisoned by it for years to come. Come back in. Look to the Lord. Ask his forgiveness, and he'll cleanse you of it. And then you can cherish the good memories and not be haunted for years to come by all of that that's gone in the past. And you know what? She turned off the engine, and she came back in, and she got it right with the Lord. So as we finish up this message this morning, it's a different one, I know. But by the way, doesn't the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy say, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with great patience and instruction. Doesn't it say that? God's called me at times to deal with hard things. And if you're sitting here this morning and you have a sour attitude and you have a disposition that is latent with bitterness and resentment, you can just linger here today and ask the Lord to cleanse that and confess it to him and be done with it so that you can live free on the earth free in Christ and not carry that bitterness that you carry. Because I know you think that that bitterness is directed toward that person that hurt you, toward that person that lied about you, slandered you, abandoned you, betrayed you, whatever they did. But the problem is, is that that resentment that you carry, it spills over into all kinds of other relationships. Get your heart right with the Lord. We all need that, don't we? Some of you, uh, I, can, I read body language. And halfway through this message, several of you's arms came up. And it was, I dare you to try to penetrate my, to get in here, Pastor. Uh, well, I don't care. God loves you too much to leave you in that condition. He wants you to be free. He wants you to be, to have a, a lift in your heel and a sparkle in your eye again. Let that person go that hurt you. Cut them loose with forgive, forgiveness. Forgive them. Because I'll give you a little secret. They are not tossing on, at night on their pillow worried and troubled by the way they treated you. They're not. And you're dragging them around with you. Stop. Let it go. And so let me end with this verse. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness. How much? All. Free. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as, just as Christ also loved you 
and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And so just as God was saying to Jonah, Jonah, it's not enough that you have good theology and you know my attributes. I want my attributes and my nature to be shared by you, which requires a heart change. And it's the same thing Paul's teaching in, Eph in Ephesians chapter 4. Wouldn't it be better to leave today free of carrying that stuff around? Yes? Well, let's just pause for a quiet moment of prayer. And in the quietness of your heart, you think to yourself, who is that person that has so wounded you? that betrayed you, lied to you, slandered you, embarrassed you, shamed you, hurt you, or abused you? Are you going to keep dragging them around? Or cut them loose? And how do we cut them loose? We say, Lord, before you, and because of the blood that you shed for me on the cross, because of all the pardon, forgiveness, and mercy you've shown me, I choose. I may not even feel like it, but I choose with everything I am to forgive that person. I forgive them, Lord, and I cut them loose so that I might walk with you and be free. Hear my prayer, Lord. Accomplish it in my heart.